Mark chapter 6. And it is a wonderful privilege to have a book that we know doesn't have any mistakes Amen. and that we can confidently preach. Amen. And it is solid and it's stable, it's unchanging, and it changes us if we let it yes. and if we allow it. And the purpose in opening this book today is to look at things from God's perspective, to straighten out our perspective, and to serve Him because of it. So we're going to begin reading in Mark chapter 6, and we're going to look down uh, from, from verse uh, 14, and just we'll read down to verse 19. Mark 6 and verse 14. This is speaking of Jesus, and of course, uh, he is... He is uh, beginning to be popular, and so popular that in verse 14 we find that King Herod heard of him. It's verse 14 begins, And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It's John whom I beheaded, he is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would help us today from this example of an individual that was tender and open to your word, but who did not commit himself to you, and God who though in word he maybe would have considered himself committed to you, though he allowed influence in his life, led him astray, help us to see how important it is that we stand for truth and that we serve you, and see the consequences that have come if we do not. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is, I find, a tragic and a fascinating story. Of course, it's filled with a, some very interesting drama. Now, we understand that Herod would have been a uh, Jewish representative king, and he would have uh, been the king of the nation of Israel. But we also understand at this time period, the nation of Israel would have been under the domination of the Roman Empire. And so, though he would have been a Jewish king, Herod would have been uh, placed, or a puppet king, uh, placed where he was to kind of be a figurehead king of the nation of Israel. Now he had certain authority and he had certain responsibilities, but he did so within the guidelines of the Roman authority or the Roman government. And so long as Herod pleased the Roman government, he kind of had uh, pretty much free reign to rule the people of Israel. And there would be things in particular that Rome would be looking for. First of all, uh, to for the Herod king to uh, squash or quash rebellion and keep things uh, just keep things on an even keel to make sure that there is not unrest among a very unrested people who uh, do not like, do not take well to being under the Roman authority and Roman government and having to pay tribute to Caesar when they consider themselves uh, a theocracy and later on a monarchy. In other words, a nation that is God's is supposed to be Israel's king and uh, though they had not done things God's way and had set themselves up a king, uh, the Jewish people resented um, having Roman authority over them, as any people do. And there are two reasons that the Jewish people resented Roman authority, and, uh, but they basically would be summarizing this, and bottom line would be rebellion. Uh, it is natural for any person not to want authority in their life. And I appreciate a Brother Nick in Sunday school today talking about how that authority is God-given. You know what's something that I was thinking about? As he was talking about the importance of placing yourself under authority without, uh, first of all, deciding whether or not the authority is, you know, worthy or so forth. One of the things that I've discovered by placing myself under authority is that authority is, is smarter than I gave them credit for. In other words, authority uh, was, the, the person that you put yourself under the authority of is more intelligent uh, than, the, uh, than you gave them credit for. Let me illustrate it this way. Most of us think we're smart. Or most of us think we're smart. Now, somebody came up and said, you think you're smart, don't you? And you'd probably say, well, not really. But the fact is that you really do. Um, in, in other words, if we were all to take a class together, we would find out who was smart based on grades, uh, ba you know, who, who could do things and, and who could be smart based upon academics and grades. But that doesn't mean everything. You say, well, pastor, it depends on how hard you work, how hard you study. And I know about that. I know about uh, the difference between 
a person who makes an A and never studies, and a person who makes an A and studies hard, and a person who studies hard and can't make an A uh, on, on a grade. And everybody has different intelligence, but there's different kinds of smarts in our mind than just academic, aren't they? You know, right. the people that aren't academic think that, you know, people that are are stupid. You know, <laughs> and, you know that academics don't mean anything and aren't important. And the reason for it is not their particular area of smart. But do most people think they know a little better? And you say, Pastor, not me. You ever criticized your boss? You ever thought your boss didn't know what they were doing and uh, that you could run things better than they could run things? Uh, you ever thought your parents didn't know the best way of doing things and thought that you could run things better than your parents do? You ever thought your husband, you know, you could, if you were the authority that you could do things a little better than your husband. One of the things that I've discovered by submitting myself to God-given authority is that the authority is more intelligent than I give them credit for. And you know that if everybody in the world thinks they're smarter than everybody else, then they all do so to the exclusion of each other. And so the person sitting next to you thinks that they're smarter than you, and you think you're smarter than them. And uh, the only person that really is intelligent is people that recognize God-given authority because the fact is, is that God gave you your intellectual limits and gave you uh, your physical capabilities. But I want to tell you something else. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between a person who knows how to do right and knows what to do and the person who does it. And I've said many times, and I believe this to be a fact, that any person who does things God's way will seem wise. And that's just a fact. You look at, look at the Bible, and you don't have to be really intelligent just to obey. And the Bible says this is a Bible principle. A good place starts the book of Proverbs. And you look at the Bible, it says, you know, it says that this is better or this is good or this is wise. And you do it, and you'll find out that the Bible is true. And people will think that you're intelligent and smart, etc., simply because things work out well in your life. And uh, well, that's just, I, I don't, I'm not sure I'm starting to get off there just a little bit. We're talking about biblical authority, and we're talking about the authority of Herod, and how that Herod had authority that was basically given to him from the Roman government, and he would be recognized by the Jewish people as having authority, although they would know that his authority really didn't come from them, it came from the Roman government. But Herod's an important fellow nonetheless, and he obviously has the ability uh, to put people to death. And so, you know, he has more authority than anybody in the city of Fort Lauderdale, I would say. He had the single-handed ability to order the execution of John the Baptist. And so I would say to you, though, you would say, well, he's not much of a king. He's king enough that if you crossed him, that would be the end for you. And so understand the authority that he has. Understand the importance of the position that he had. Now, the Bible said in verse 14 in our text, when we begin, where we begin our text, speaking of Jesus that King Herod had heard of him, but and the reason for it was that his name was spread abroad. Now, what was the reason that Jesus' name was spread abroad? Well, because of what he did. People knew who Jesus was because of what he did. What did he do? Ultimately, the greatest and, and the, the most powerful thing that Jesus did was forgive sins. You remember when the man that was sick with the palsy was let down? We looked at it a few weeks back, and they were let down. And, and, and Jesus healed him. And, they, and, and you remember when Jesus had asked on different occasions when, uh, with regard to the Sabbath day, and uh, he had asked, what is greater? What is greater to heal somebody, to say, take up thy bed and walk, as he said to the man sick of the palsy, or to forgive sins? And the answer to the question is, it is a greater ability to forgive sins because only God can forgive sins. And yet God could give man the power to heal. And Jesus, as he worked in his earthly ministry, if you study the scripture, God gave Jesus the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, because of that, that you and I could do greater things than he did uh, because of his going to the Father and because of the promise of the Father, God's Holy Spirit. Study the baptism of Christ. And you look at what happened when Jesus surrendered to the will of the Father through his baptism. Jesus wasn't converted. Jesus wasn't saved. His baptism wasn't a, wasn't a sign of anything other than submission to the will of the Father. When Jesus submitted to the will of the Father, he surrendered his ability as God. He was fully God, but he surrendered his ability to accomplish things as God. Anything that Jesus did in his earthly ministry, he could easily have done as the Son of God, but he did not because he was modeling for us the uh, being the second Adam, the man who, uh, though he is in the likeness of sinful flesh, 
yet lived without sin. And Jesus didn't use special God-given abilities to, have, to conquer sin, my friend. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came with the same temptations that you and I have, with the difference that he did not succumb to those, those temptations. And he laid down, he surrendered his authority as God the Father and worked through the power of God's Holy Spirit. And everything that Jesus accomplished in his life, the healing, etc., he accomplished through the work of his Holy Spirit. But when he asked the question, what is greater, to forgive sin or to say, rise, take up thy bed and walk, the answer to the question is, it's a greater thing to forgive sin. Listen, the man that's sick with the palsy today is benefited in a far greater way because of his sins being forgiving him than he is from being healed physically. But Jesus said that the reason he healed that man was not because the man needed healing, was not because the man came to him for I don't believe you study the text, the man came to him for healing. The reason that uh, Jesus healed the man was so that they could know that he came from the Father. And so he did so for his own testimony to say, I come from God the Father, or so that you can know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said, I say unto thee, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And so that's the sort of thing that Herod has heard about. Uh, we saw when he went into the Gadarenes, the country of the Gadarenes, he took this man who came to him who was possessed with a multitude of demons, and Jesus cast out the devils. And we see that as he goes into the synagogues, the first thing Jesus did in every synagogue was to cast out demons, to cast out devils. And the place where God should have been, and the place where individuals should have been worshiping God, one of the first things Jesus did every time he went to the synagogue was clean house and cast out the devils and cast out evil spirits that were in people and that were in the place of worship who were possessed with evil spirits. And so this is noised abroad. One of the main things that we see Jesus doing besides healing is that people are bringing to him those that are possessed with evil spirits and he's cast them out and Herod has heard about it. And when Herod heard about Jesus, he did not think of the one that John the Baptist preached of he thought of the one who had preached to him and caused him conviction. I want to look at some things today about Herod. I just I want to preach probably a little different message than many of us have maybe heard, but I think is very scriptural, very biblical, and some things that we ought to consider about Herod. First thing I want to point out uh, is that Herod had great opportunity. I want you to understand this morning that Herod had great opportunity. Herod had great opportunity, I say, to serve the Lord. Here he is, and he is in a time when because of their rebellion, God's people, the nation of Israel, are in a sense in bondage and captivity. And yet Herod is not out, he's not uh, in exile, he's not cast out of the land, but he is actually given government authority by the Roman government, and he has the ability to lead God's people. And so Herod has a great opportunity. A matter of fact, I want to uh, point out to you, not only did Herod have great opportunity to serve the Lord, not only did he have great opportunity to uh, help the gospel message and the good news of Jesus, Go forward. Who could promote the Messiah, the Savior of the world, like the, the, the king of the Jews, like the physical king of the Jews? Nobody could have. Herod had the greatest opportunity of anybody alive to promote the king of the Jews. And, and by the way, I, I want to point out secondly that Herod was for the Messiah. Herod was for the king of the Jews. You know, a lot of times we think, well, Herod wanted the king of the Jews to be put to death. And we think about before, the, before Jesus was born, how that the Herod at that time had uh, uh, ordered that all the children under two years of age be put to death, and how that Jesus had to go and eat it. But he's dead. And there's a different Herod with a different <coughs> attitude that is alive at this time. And so it's a very interesting situation. And Herod hears about Jesus and the things that Jesus has done and we see that, not only that, that he had great opportunity, but when Jesus' name was spread abroad, Herod said that it's John the Baptist who was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works to show, them, show forth themselves in him. Now I have to say to you, if Herod had to have a case of mistaken identity about Jesus, at least he had a good uh, perspective of, of where Jesus came from. See, Herod had had no argument at all that John the Baptist came from God. And by the way, uh, if Jesus had to be compared to a physical man, he himself said about John the Baptist that there hasn't been a greater man than John the Baptist. There's never been a greater prophet given than John the Baptist. He's the greatest. And boy, I mean, you start to do some comparison of different prophets and different men that God used, and boy, that's quite a compliment for John the Baptist. Boy, look at Moses. 
the great, uh, and he was, he was a great prophet figure, and he prophesied for the Lord and led God's people. And Moses was a wonderful man, greatly used of God. The nation of Israel still looks back today to Moses. Look at a David, a man like David. Or how about this? How about David?